Thank you, everybody. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me this space. And I'd like to thank so many of you who are in the room for having taught me so many of the things that I'm using in this intervention. It's because of what you've taught me and shared with me that I'm able to speak here today. So I'm wrapping up a little bit by pulling together some of the ideas on strategies within our systems, both for the social movements and the strategies that we're implementing on our own and together at grassroots level, but also the strategies that we're using at institutional level, working together. Urgency now represents somewhere between one million and one and a half million people involved in community-supported agriculture as producers or consumers, who are all parts of national and local networks all over the world. And I have a, this way. I have a technical problem. Okay. The first thing I want to share. It's okay. The first thing I want to share with you is that our strategy must always be adapted to the level of governance. For example, take the issue of land, which was one of the key themes here in Milan. Land zoning is always the affair of local authorities. So we need to work with local authorities to preserve our urban and peri-urban land for food production. We also have included this in part of an instrument, which is the voluntary guidelines to the tenure of land, fisheries, and forests. The question of zoning is really a key one. The second thing is the issue of food policy councils, which is something that is already well developed in the United States and Canada, but which we are working on through many different networks together to introduce into Europe and also other parts of the world. Because that is how we as social movements, as producers of all kinds, can work together to build local food systems, because the idea behind everything we're doing is not just to produce. We're producing for people. We're producing for people locally, and we're building our local food systems. The other aspect in terms of local authorities is that a lot of funding is available only at local level through the devolution of power. For example, funding comes down to local authority level for social inclusion projects, and that includes part of the right to food and the right to the city. So that is important. There are also funding that is available in terms of regional government, which is for capacity building, so that our movements mobilize that funding to build capacity within our movements and also between ourselves and other movements. National laws and policies obviously are what dominate the national sphere, but at European level, there is a dual aspect, which is that there is European policy, but it is up to the national governments to respect the principle of subsidiarity. So that, for example, while Europe is taking a very inconclusive position on pesticides today, certain countries, in terms of their subsidiarity, have said, we do not want pesticides, we are banning pesticides, or we do not want any GMOs, we are banning GMOs. So this question of subsidiarity is a vital aspect in working together to build our food systems, because we can work together with those countries that have taken a strong position on these, on these aspects. 
Across the board, more importantly today, we need to work together on building the new CAP policy and in standing together to fight against TTIP or in other parts of the world against TPP and to fight against the special courts of the ISDS. In Europe alone, over two million people have now signed the petition to stop TTIP. So it is very important in the coming days for those of you who are aware of this to sign on to write to your European mem members of parliament and to support us in our struggles to stop what will actually remove much of our sovereignty at national level. There are also international guidelines that are developed within the UN bodies and particularly within the Committee on World Food Security where the civil society mechanism, which is unique and which several of you here in the room are members of, and where civil society and social movements in particular are working on policy related to food. And it is a unique space where we work together. Okay, thank you. I apologize, I am not a geek. So, in terms of the United Nations in building this policy, we work on realizing different rights. The right to food, obviously, is the central one, but it is essential to always bear in mind that human rights are indivisible, and that the right to food brings together peasants' rights, indigenous people's rights, consumers' rights, and also workers' rights, because there is a workers' constituency as well. So that these are all aspects that are interrelated. Mariam spoke wonderfully about the importance of biodiversity. I'm just going to show you a few photographs that illustrate the different aspects of what is important and what we're working on. Without bees, there is no pollination, yet bees are dying off. There are fewer and fewer. I have nothing but plants that attract bees in my garden. Now, I can see from one year to the next how the pesticides in the region I live in have affected the bee colonies. Fortunately, in my home in Ireland, there are still lots and lots of bees, and this is a bee in my garden on a fuchsia plant, on fuchsia tree in fuchsia, is one of the symbols of the region where I live. Biodiversity is also wild. It's not just cultivated. And of course, mushrooms are a part of that too. Water is another issue that has been dealt with extensively in the meeting that we've had over the last three days. Water is an essential part of our lives, part of our lives in terms of cultivating, in terms of breeding animals and raising livestock, in terms of fresh water, and in terms of human survival. So water is something that we must and are continuing to place at the center of our strategy. And there is now a working group to produce a policy document currently being developed in the Committee on Food Security that will be debated in October of this year with a very strong civil society working group led by one of the people who made a presentation here. Peasants' rights are central because peasants' rights are not just for those who work the land. Peasants' rights include all the other constituencies. They include pastoralist rights, like these young girls in the High Atlas in Morocco. They include fishers' rights, and in that case, it is particularly difficult today for fishers to have access to their fishing grounds. This photograph is taken just a couple of hundred meters from where I live in Ireland, and this boat is typical. There are very few boats left, and the boats have very little fish left to catch, so fishers' rights are particularly important also not just in the sea but in fresh water this is some fish that was caught in uganda and it shows the tilapia just freshly caught that are about to be auctioned 
But there's a small quantity. It's just a few fish strung together. And also, as I said, the indigenous people's rights. Because their rights to their territories, their rights to their seeds, to their culture, are an integral part of everything that we are fighting for. Consumers' rights, there is actually policy doc there is a policy document and an instrument specific to consumers rights but consumers rights to have access to healthy local food this is a photograph taken at the beijing farmers market which is different from the other market that was presented it's a market that was developed back to back with the community supported agriculture network so that the producers, the small scale family producers, sell to their consumer groups every week, but they also have the farmer's market. And it is a pop-up market. Sometimes it has to change places. It's not a fixed market. And they have to get around all kinds of transport regulations and health and safety regulations. But the consumers are happy to go there. And as you can see, none of the produce there that you have here is necessarily very standard or beautiful, but it is produced locally. The issue of climate change is also one of the questions that we have discussed. And of course, climate change, as Ibrahim said earlier on, is drought, it's typhoons, it's many different things, but it is also extreme cold. This looks like a lovely picture when you look at it, but the people in this chalet couldn't get out of their house. They were snowed in. So there's a negative side to this picture, although it looks really lovely. And of course, we have to, as many people have already said here, fight against trade regulations and fight against the control of transnational corporations on our system be it our seeds, be it the trade, be it the agribusiness, whatever level, these are things that we as social movements together are fighting, will continue to fight, and with everybody's support. It seems to me that one of the challenges that we face as social movements is that there are many different parts of the UN system. They're delocalized, they're in different countries, they're in, on different subjects, there are different legal instruments. I tried to put them into one chart. I'm not going to go through it because I would take too much time and Giuseppe would be very angry with me. But this is, of course, available to everybody. And the idea is to think about the fact that, yes, it is all over the place, and yes, there are all these different legal instruments, but at the same time, these institutions have the difficulty to adapt to working together because they have historically worked as silos, whereas we as social movements work together. But we in the social movements are working on one thing that is very clear, which is the right to food, so that we can use all these different legal instruments together, and we do. And there are many people here who have incredibly deep specialized knowledge. But as we work, be it within the International Planning Committee on Food Sovereignty or within the civil society mechanism, we build our strategies together, sharing our specialized knowledge on all these subjects. So what is the right to food? Well, it is also based on this incredible biodiversity of what exists locally. If you think aubergines, you probably think beautiful, uniform, purple vegetables. And in China, what did I see on one of the farms we visited? Well, there were green aubergines, there were white aubergines, and the purple one wasn't a sort of nice roundy one. It was this long stringy one. So this is all just to illustrate the biodiversity of just one thing. So from grassroots to policy, well, obviously, as grassroots social movements, we are building the alternatives. We know the solutions. We are doing it. We are putting it into practice. At the same time, we need to work to build things at the institutional level. 
Our, but our strategy is not built top-down. Our strategy is built on talking peer-to-peer, -peer, working together within our movement, with other grassroots movements, to reach consensus. And we are working from that consensual base. This is something that the institutions are recognizing now, and it is our biggest strength. We are also working at many, many different levels, but our strength, as I said, is our work together and our communication. Again, another picture from the Beijing farmer's market. We talk very often of Buen Vivir, and to me, these two young Chinese girls are a perfect picture of Buen Vivir. They're happy, they're doing what they love doing, they love making their produce, they love selling it, and they're young, so don't let anybody say there aren't any youth involved. There are both youth and women, and they're out there. What are the challenges? Well, we are facing some very, very serious challenges. First of all, there is increased repression. As our movements grow and reach a critical mass, so the repression becomes harder because we are a danger, we're a real threat to the transnational corporations and to agribusiness. So there's the threat of repression. There's the threat of violence in Latin America, in Africa, and even in other parts of the world. People are killed for defending their land. People are killed for defending their seeds. People are killed for defending their right to their territories and to food. And this means we must stand up and be counted and defend the right to life as well as the right to food. There is also a singular betrayal by our duty bearers, those elected representatives who we put in office, who have betrayed us, who are about to sign these terrible treaties like TTIP and TPP and TISA. So this is a huge challenge. The corporate capture of our ideas and of our success stories in, is an additional threat. It's also very insidious because as we reach a critical mass, for example, CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, has now reached a critical mass in many countries. So it's being captured by companies that are traditional capitalist trading companies that are buying at a very low price from local farmers, they have a website, you can see what the farmer looks like, you feel good, you're buying local produce, but the farmer is not getting that high percentage that is agreed and the share of the risks and the benefits of the whole solidarity economy approach that we would have in other solutions. So the capture of our good initiatives is something we need to be very careful of. There is also legislation, for example, on certain economic aspects, on introduction of so-called agroecology that is very, very restrictive, that it reduces agroecology to a set of tools. And as Mariam just explained, agroecology is something that covers production, consumption, our culture, our territories, and everything in a totally holistic way. So we must be careful not to allow ourselves to be reduced through legislation or whatever. Same as I have already said about short distribution chains. Greenwashing, greenwashing goes so far, you wouldn't believe it. Corporations, for example, in Eastern Europe, are given a total tax break if they put money into funding solidarity economy projects, including community-funded projects on agriculture, like community gardens and things. This is not acceptable. This is really, really not acceptable. We do not belong to corporations. And greenwashing our initiatives, be it fair trade, be it one thing or another, it's totally unacceptable and it happens a huge amount. I mentioned already the difficulty of the compartmentalization of institutions, and this is a challenge we're all facing. And the social movement's consensual approach takes time. When I get an email saying, 
that the CFS needs case studies for tomorrow. What do I have to do? I end up spending all night on my computer looking for case studies. In the policy negotiation process, we have 24 or 48 hours to adapt, react to proposals on the policy that are being made by the task team. Well, we can't go back to grassroots level. It's totally impossible. We have to fight for more time in everything, and this is one of the biggest challenges that I have found working within the institutions. Also, the Sustainable Development Goals in the post-2015 poses a challenge. How much of that funding is ever going to empower grassroots? We have to fight. We won't change much, but we need to fight, and there are people here who are working on that already, to fight so that some of this money actually really comes down to grassroots level for people to work on. So it's between Geneva and Rome where we do a lot of our institutional work. I just want to mention that there are three, just so that people really understand, the CFS, the Committee on World Food Security and Nutrition, builds policy documents that are voted on by the states. They then become policy, which may or may not be binding, depending on whether the states actually sign up to it. The civil society mechanism has working groups, has, has, has interventions in the policy debates, and is funded by the states so that there is a genuine space for social movements. The FAO works at different levels, and it's quite complex, and it took me a long time to understand what happens there. On one hand, there is the implementation of CFS policy. On the other hand, there are the regional conferences every two years, where the civil society consultation brings out certain things, where again, we work on this together and prepare, prepare it, so that these things will then become regional policy, and then will be worked on at country level. But the FAO also has thematic working groups and that will have funding to work on certain things. So it is quite a complex situation and quite difficult for us as social movements to work around this, but we do. So we are working, building our solutions at grassroots level building sustainable local food systems. Agroecology, I have already talked, so I will not mention it again, but it is what we are working on. It is our priority as social movements to bring all the different aspects of our struggles together. And as Mariam said, the declaration, the Nieleni Declaration is a very, very deep and successful document. Local food policy councils, social movements working together, low carbon solutions like using horses to plow instead of huge great big tractors, the fact that many CSAs are distributing using a bicycle with a sort of a thing attached there behind it so they can bring the food into the distribution point on a zero carbon basis. And all of this adds up to food sovereignty in action. One final thing I will leave you with, or almost final thing, is how we at Urgency have worked from our objectives to develop our strategy and interfaces. Because I think it is an interesting example not to push for Urgency, but to say how come and how we have managed to work with maybe five or five, at least five of the different networks that are here. Because in our programs, we are part of IPC. We work with the Semence Paysanne because many of our producers work with the seed network. We are part of the Nieleni process and we're also part of Hungry for Rights. We are actively involved in the solidarity economy movement because our two pillars are equal equally important on one hand food sovereignty, but also being part of a change in economic paradigm. We can't just talk about food sovereignty at a certain moment. We need other kinds of change as well, energy change, 
financial change, and this is part of solidarity economy, so that there is a strong interface with the solidarity economy movement through RIPES, of which I'm also a member. We work with different entry points at the UN through all of this, in particular with the United Nations Interagency Task Force on Social and Solidarity Economy, and where their publications have spoken a great deal about food sovereignty now. So this all comes together. We also work with European Union funded projects and local food policies, and all of this from our core objectives then feeds into creating and contributing to global food policy. We do it together, we work together between social movements. This is an IPC pre pre preparatory meeting for a consultation between the FAO and IPC. And to conclude, We've come a long way. We still have a few dots to join, but we're doing well, and thank you very much. <laughs>